everyone is excited about the revolution of artificial intelligence. Signed a statement warning of the risks of artificial intelligence. So what I called for an economist uh, editorial earlier this weekend in the TED. I unveiled chat GPT-4. A non-human term which can outwork humans in most areas. And I think it came at exactly the right time. I almost without trying to sound pessimistic, there was a point where I kind of felt like I was losing hope. What they're doing is getting a lot of information from the internet. Well, Dr. Hinton also told the BBC the rate of progress is worrying. Right now, what we're seeing is um, things like GPT-4. But when this revolution actually start from? Real strategy, because how can you possibly know where we're going unless you know, the, the challenge with a moratorium is that it's incredibly hard to enforce. Um, the responsible actors would be more likely to, to follow it, the irresponsible actors wouldn't. Should we allow AI machines to flood the internet with propaganda and fake news? Contrary to common belief, artificial intelligence is not a new word and not a new technology for researchers. This technology is much older than you would imagine. Although the term artificial intelligence or AI wasn't coined until the mid 20th century, the idea of building intelligent systems has fascinated human beings for thousands of years. Even there are the myths of mechanical men in ancient Greek and Egyptian myths. The Roman poet Virgil was said to have designed a series of animated wooden statues, each representing a province of the Roman Empire, and holding a bell that would ring if the province threatened revolt. If we go back to 8th century, we find Hephaestus, the son of Hera and Zeus, the Greek god of blacksmiths, sculptures, metallurgy, fire and volcanoes in Homer. He was the blacksmith of Olympus and made weapons for all gods. He has invented countless interesting machines, one of the most famous of which was the earliest conception of a robot in the world called Talus. It was a giant constructed of bronze that acted as guardian for the island of Crete around 400 BCE. As a guard, he walked around the island three times a day. If a stranger came, he would turn into red hot fire and embrace the stranger when he or she landed. The story of Talus shows that ancient Greeks expected artificial intelligence to be similar to human beings. They should be in the shape of human beings and have similar body structures. However, it should be capable of accomplishing things that human beings are not capable of doing, like Talus turning to fire. Even there was a human-machine relationship, which we call emotion or love in a Roman poet from Ovidius and Nasso in his narrative poem Metamorphosis about Pygmalion, who was a king and a sculptor of Cyprus who fell in love with a statue he had carved. He prayed to the goddess Venus to turn his statue into a real woman. Venus answered his prayers and he had a son called Paphos with that woman. We call the Pygmalion statue an artificial sex partner, a robot at the moment. Your wife is ready to go home. Her vitals, brain activity and battery have all been charged and are ready for companionship. How do you feel? Feel. Familiar. If we look at artificial legends in medieval areas, we can see there were a lot of stories including the one in Nature of Things which was written by Swiss alchemist Paracelsus in which he describes fabricating artificial men by replacing the sperm of a man in a horse dung and feeding it in the arcanium of man's blood after 40 days which will lead to a living infant. 
The earliest written account regarding golem making is found in the writing of Eleazar ben Judda of Worms in the early 13th century. It was believed that the animation of golem could be achieved by the insertion of a piece of paper with any of God's name on it into the mouth of the clay figure. Also, we know there were other stories like Taquin, the artificial creation of life, which was a frequent topic of Ismaili alchemical manuscripts, or the one in Faust, the second part of the tragedy by John Wolfgang van Gothi, an alchemically fabricated homonucleus destined to live forever in the flask in which he was made, and the verse to be born into a fully human body. Moving to early modern period, a brazen head was another legendary self-operating machine whose ownership was ascribed to scholars such as Roger Bacon, who had developed a reputation as a wizard. It was reputed to be able to correctly answer any question put to it, although it was sometimes restricted to yes or no answers. But all the one explained before were the stories from different authors and not the real made artificial beings. What about the real inventions of scientists in ancient Greek and medieval periods? Let's take a step back to ancient times. In those periods, inventors made things called automatons, which were mechanical and moved independently of human intervention. The word automaton comes from ancient Greek and means acting of one's own will. There was a religious belief in ancient Egypt and Greece about a scarred status at the oldest automata having wisdom and emotion. One of the other earliest records of an automaton comes from 400 BCE and refers to a mechanical steam-powered pigeon created by a friend of a philosopher Plato called Archytas. The study of mechanical or formal reasoning, which is the based assumption in artificial intelligence that says human thoughts can be mechanized, has a long history. Philosophers including Aristotle, Euclid, William of Ockham, and Duns Scotus all developed structure methods of formal deduction in different eras. You're a governess. Well done. Yes, well done. Shall we? Waiter. Your student. It's a boy of eight. Charlie's seven, actually. Oh. Oh. Finished tall for his age. He flicked in kitchen today. <gasps> Is there ink on my face? There's nothing wrong with your face. There are two drops on your ear, in fact. India blue is nearly impossible to wash off. Anyway, a very impetuous act by the boy, but you're too experienced to react rashly, which is why the lady for whom you worked lent you that necklace. Oriental pearls, diamonds, a flawless ruby, hardly the gems of a governess. However, the jewels you are not wearing tell us rather more. Holmes, you were engaged. The ring is gone, but the lighter skin would at once sat suggests that you spent some time abroad wearing it proudly. That is, until you were informed of its true and rather modest worth, at which point you broke off the engagement and returned to England for better prospects. However, the significant improvement in the development of formal reasoning started in the year 1308 when Spanish philosopher Roman Lull published the ultimate general art, a method of combining religious and philosophical attributes selected from several lists. With this work, Lull became one of the first people to try to make logical deductions in mechanical rather than a mental way. Lull also invented numerous machines for this purpose. One method is now called the Lullian circle, each of which consisted of two or more paper discs inscribed with alphabetical letters or symbols that referred to lists of attributes. 
The disk could be rotated individually to generate a large number of combinations of ideas. A number of terms or symbols relating to those terms were laid around the full circumference of the circle. They were then repeated on an inner circle which could be rotated. These combinations were said to show all possible truths about the subject of the circle. Lul based this on the notion that there were limited number of basic, undeniable truths in all fields of knowledge and that we could understand everything about these fields of knowledge by studying combinations of these elemental truths. Lul's work had a great influence on Gottfried Leibniz who redeveloped his ideas. In the 17th century, Leibniz, Thomas Hobbes and Rhone Descartes explored the possibility that all rational thought could be made as systematic as algebra or geometry. Hobbes famously wrote in Leviathan, reason is nothing but rockening. Leibniz also envisioned a universal language of reasoning, the Characteristica Universalis which could reduce argumentation to calculation and argue that all ideas are nothing but combinations of relatively small number of simple concepts. These philosophers had begun to articulate the physical symbol system hypothesis that would become the guiding face of AI research. But it was just the beginning of AI revolution. In the early 18th century, depictions of all-knowing machines akin to computers were more widely discussed in popular literature. Jonathan Swift's novel Gulliver's Travels mentioned a device called the Engine, which is one of the earliest references to modern-day technology, specifically a computer. This device's intended purpose was improve knowledge and mechanical operations to a point where even the least talented person would seem to be skilled, all with the assistance and knowledge of a non-human mind. Four decades later, in 1763, English mathematician established Bayesian inference, which became a leading approach in machine learning. Following that, there were some attempts related to artificial intelligence in the 19th century, including the arguments of George Bull in 1854 about logical reasoning which could be performed systematically in the same manner as solving a system of equations. By the 19th century, ideas about artificial men and thinking machines were developed in fictions like Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and Speculation, Samuel Butler's novel Erwin, published in 1872, which toyed with the idea that at an indeterminate point in the future, machines would have the potential to possess consciousness. Butler's book of the machine is another work of his that discusses the potentially dangerous ideas of machine consciousness and self-replicating machines. One of the last attempts regarding mechanical systems was the world's first radio-controlled vessel by Nikola Tesla who described the boats as equipped with a borrowed mind. Once the 20th century hit, the pace with which innovation and in artificial intelligence grew was significant. The first half of 20th century was the building block for the revolution ahead of people at that time. The science fiction familiarized the world with the concept of artificially intelligent robots. It began with the heartless the man from the Wizard of Oz, and continued with the humanoid robot that impersonated Maria in Metropolis in 1927. Besides the science fiction part, in the revolution of AI, other important factors were included within the period. In 1913, Russell and Whitehead presented a formal treatment of the foundation of mathematics in their masterpiece, the Principa Mathematica, which was inspired by the work of George Bull, The Laws of Thought in 1854. The Bull's book included the mathematical foundation involving equations 
as well as an extended class of problems and a range of applications. One year later, something very new happened in human life. One of the first chess player machines without human intervention was demonstrated by the Spanish engineer Leonardo Torres Cuevendo. This machine played an end game with three chess pieces, automatically moving a white king and a rock to checkmate the black king moved by a human opponent. This device could be considered the first computer game in history. It created great excitement when it made its debut at the University of Paris. It was first widely mentioned in Scientific American as Torres and his remarkable automatic devices on November 6, 1915. In 1951, the chess player defeated Savielli Tartakower at the Paris Cybernetic Congress, being the first grandmaster to lose against a machine. But this wasn't the stop point for automation development in human lives. The study of mathematical logic also provided the essential breakthrough that made artificial intelligence seem plausible. Inspired by Russell's success, David Hilbert challenged mathematicians of the 1920s and 30s to answer this fundamental question. Can all the mathematical reasoning be formalized? Finally, in 1921, Carol Capek, writer and journalist, introduced the word robot in his science fiction play R.U.R., officially for the first time in history in the middle of World War I. R.U.R. soon became influential after its publication. By 1923, it had been translated into 30 languages and was successful in its time in Europe and North America. A couple of years later, in 1925, Francis P. Handina publicly demonstrated his radio-controlled driverless car American Wonder in New York City streets, traveling up Broadway and down Fifth Avenue through thick traffic. The radio signals operated small electric motors that directed every moment of the car. Four years later, 1929, biologist Makoto Nishimura was concerned about the idea of robots being seen as slaves to humans, particularly as portrayed in the play R.U.R. written by Carol Capek. Nishimura set out to build a different kind of robot, or as he called it, an artificial human. The robot he wanted to build would celebrate nature and humanity and rather than a slave, it would be a friend and even an inspirational model to people. He finally created the first robot in the East called Geku Tensuku, which means learning from the laws of nature in the Japanese language. It was a huge invention at that time. In 1931, Hilbert questions regarding the possibility of formalizing all mathematical reasoning was answered by a 20-year-old mathematician, Kurt Gödel. His incompleteness proof in a simple term says a formal system defined by an algorithm such as a computer program cannot be simultaneously consistent and complete. There needs to be an external force, in this case, humans to control these programs at some point in the future. A great example of this goes back to shutting down two Facebook chatbots, Alice and Bob, which I'll come to that in the present time. Now let's back to 1936, the year in which one of the most important people in the 20th century started to change the world of technology and artificial intelligence, known as the father of AI. The man who set the foundation of modern computer science and more important one, artificial intelligence. Alan Turing. You probably have heard of his name if you have watched The Limitation Game in which Benedict Cumberbatch played Turing's role during World War II. An English mathematician who was born in London in June of 1912 a genius cryptonalist who first graduated from King's College Cambridge in mathematics and then went to Princeton. In 1936, he wrote a paper with the title on computable numbers when an application to the Einsteinian problem or decision problem. 
laying the theoretical foundation of modern computing. Einstein's problem posed by Hilbert and Ackerman asks for an algorithm that considers as input a statement and answers yes or no according to whether the statement is universally valid, which basically means is the statement true or false, whether it can be solved or not. If it can be solved, it means the system is decidable. Alan Turing came up with a solution called the Universal Computing Machine, which is known as the Turing Machine. A Turing machine is an idealized model of a central processing unit CPU that controls all data manipulation done by a computer with the conical machine using sequential memory to store data. Typically, the sequential memory is represented as a tape of infinite lengths on which the machine can perform, read, and write operations. There is also a state variable which we can hold a piece of information about the current state of the machine and a set of rules that describes what the machine does. Imagine we want to find if, in our small tape, there are even number of zeros and ones. The machine based on a simple internal state can answer the question. If we look at the certain internal state, we can see there is a start point which says if the machine reads zero, it replaces with X and moves the right to state B. After that, if there is a zero or X, it doesn't change anything and move to the right. Following that, if there is one, it changes it to X and goes to the left. After that, the machine needs to be reset to reach the blank square to start all over again. If it crosses all numbers, we can see that there are even numbers of zeros and ones. But there is one question. Do we need different machines for different problems? The answer is simply no. Turing realized that any internal state table could be coded into a list of ones and zeros. That's why he named his machine Universal, which was later coined by his doctoral advisor Alonzo Church as Turing Machine. This is basically what current computers do. They can do different tasks after they are built because they are programmable. Well, we are close to 1939 in our timeline which is the World War II. During the Second World War, Turing worked for the government code and cipher school at Bletchley Park, Britain's code-breaking center that produced Ultra, a design machine to break high-level encrypted radio enemy signals. After a while, by the direct order of Winston Churchill, Allen became in charge of breaking off the best encrypted machines of Nazis, Enigma machine. The only machine that the great Churchill was afraid of at that time. No one thought it was breakable. Obviously, they were underestimating Turing's talents. Finally, he made an electromechanical machine that could find settings for the Enigma machine. Turing played a crucial role in cracking intercepted coded messages that enabled the Allies to defeat the Axis powers in many crucial engagements including the Battle of the Atlantic. At the same time, calculating machines were common, but thinking machines or reasoning machines were not. The first modern computers were the massive machines of the Second World War, such as Z3 ABC, which was the first automatic electronic digital computer with a weight over 700 pounds, and ENIAC, which was the first programmable electronic general purpose digital computer completed in 1945. ENIAC was based on the theoretical foundation laid by Alan Turing and developed by John Van Neumann and proved to be the most influential. About five years later, in 1950, Turing proposed something that was a huge force in the development of AI, the limitation game. Turing believed it's difficult to define the concept of thinking so he changed the question from could machine think to a three-person game in which there is a human evaluator who judges natural language conversations between a human and a machine designed to generate human-like responses. The conversation would be limited to a text-only channel such as computer keyboard and screen so the result would not depend on the machine's ability 
to render words as speech. If the evaluator could not reliably tell the machine from the human, the machine would be said to have passed the test. We call this the Turing test, which tests a machine's ability to exhibit intelligent behavior equivalent to or indistinguishable from that of a human. You may wonder what happened to Alan Turing after he helped the British government to win the Second World War II. Was he rewarded? <laughs> the answer is no. He was betrayed by his own country because of his homosexuality and he forced to take the hormone therapy and then he killed himself in 1952. Or let me paraphrase it this way. He was killed suspiciously. So that's why you should never trust your government. Although Thuring's effort was significant in the 1940s, it wasn't the whole story of AI development at that time. In the 1940s, few scientists began to discuss the possibility of creating an artificial brain. There were two scientists in 1943 who first described what later researchers would call a neural network. Warren McCulloch and Walter Pitts, they published a paper called A Logical Calculus of the Ideas Eminent in Nervous Activity. This influential paper in which they discussed networks of idealized and simplified artificial neurons and how they might perform simple logical functions became the inspiration of neural networks and later deep learning. The ideas of thinking machine like brain networks was further developed by computer scientist Edmund Barclay's book Giant Brains in 1949. He compared a human brain if it were made of hardware and wire instead of flesh and nerves, describing a machine's ability to that of the human mind, stating that a machine therefore can think. This was followed by the Turing test that we discussed in 1950. One year later, a 24-year-old graduate inspired by the work of Pitts and Macaulay called Marvin Minsky built the first neural net machine in 1951, the SNARK. I get the American origins of computers. Nobody is publishing on active learning. In fact, we loaned the big machine to some students at Dartmouth. I'm familiar with and can recognize an advance in that area. Along with some photographs of this machine, which was called the SNARK, Stochastic Neural Analog Reinforcement. This machine is considered one of the first pioneering attempts in the field of artificial intelligence. In the same year, the world of video games involving AI systems known as Game AI was developed by different computer scientists, including Christopher Strachey, who is mostly known as the first one who possibly developed a video game in history. He used the Frenti Mark I machine, which is also known as Manchester Electronic Computer, the first commercially available electronic general purpose stored program to write a checkers program. However, the development of video games was not limited to his work. There were other scientists like Dietrich Prince who wrote a program for chess, but the real spark in this industry did not happen until an American computer scientist named Arthur Samuel developed the first self-learning program capable of playing checkers in 1952. A game that could learn by itself. The program was a sensational demonstration of the advances in both hardware and skilled programming and caused IBM stock to increase 15 points overnight. His pioneering non-numerical programming helped shape the instruction set of processors as he was one of the first to work with computers on projects other than computation. Around 1955, the AI development was coming close to its revolution. 
a few scientists instinctively recognized that a machine that could manipulate numbers could also manipulate symbols and that the manipulation of symbols could well be the sense of human thought. This field was called symbolic AI which was a new approach to creating thinking machines. In December 1955, the proof of concept was initialized through Alan Newell, Cliff Shaw and Herbert Simons, logic theorist. The logic theorist was a program designed to mimic the problem-solving skills of a human and was funded by the Research and Development Corporation or RAND. It's considered by many to be the first artificial intelligence program. It actually happened at age 27.7, so I can tell you I've been through conversion experiences before, and, and this is one of those. I went into the office of my colleague, Cliff Shaw, we weren't quite colleagues on AI at that time, but we had been working together on, on the simulations that we were doing for this sort of thing, and I repeated verbatim. Simon said that they had solved the vulnerable mind-body problem, explaining how a system composed of matter can have the properties of mind. Everything was prepared for the actual revolution of AI, the term that could influence the humanity, a conference that started all. In the summer of 1956, scientists gathered for a conference at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire, which was organized by Marvin Minsky, John McCarty, and two other senior scientists from International Business Machine Corporation, or the famous IBM. They believed that aspects of learning as well as other characteristics of human intelligence can be stimulated by machines. This seminal event in the history of AI included those who created important programs during the first decades of AI research. Ray Solomon, Oliver Selfridge, Tranchard Moore, Arthur Samuel, Alan Newell and Herbert Simon. During the conference, the participants discussed a wide range of topics related to AI, such as natural language processing, problem solving, and machine learning. They also laid out a roadmap for AI research, including the development of programming languages and algorithms for creating intelligent machines. Even the logic theories that I mentioned before debuted in this conference by Simon and Newell. However, the most important part of this workshop was coining the term AI officially for the first time in history by an American computer scientist, John McCarthy. Many of the early computer programs that could play games, solve puzzles, prove mathematical theorems, and perform artificial reasoning were developed in the years immediately following the Dartmouth workshop. The concepts of machine learning and artificial neural networks, two of the main pillars of the current AI systems, were also formalized around this time. In the neural network field, a lot of people were inspired by the work of Macaulay and Pitt's paper, the 1944, but the most influential one was the effort led by Frank Rosenblatt in 1957 to build perceptron machines up to four layers, which was able to recognize images and learn the difference between geometric shapes. In technical terms, the perceptron was a binary classifier that could learn to classify input patterns into two categories. It works by taking a set of input values and computing a weighted sum of those values, followed by a threshold function that determines whether the output is 1 or 0. The weights are adjusted during the training process to optimize the performance of the classifier. The perceptron was seen as a major milestone in AI because it demonstrated the potential of machine learning algorithms to mimic human intelligence. It showed that machines could learn from experience and improve their performances over time, much like humans do. In other words, the perceptron paved the way for AI. 
following this achievement at that time, there were other developments in the AI field. One of those was development of the first programming language for numeric and scientific computing called Fortran. Also, there was the rise of an agency called the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, in February 1958, which was responsible for the development of emerging technologies for use by the military. This merger of AI and the military led DARPA and other governmental agencies to pour money into this new field in the following years. It's quite interesting that the government and quite a, an agency with a military background started to pour money into AI field for the first time in history. And I think this is a very important point, but I'll come to that later. But for now, let's go back to 1958, the year that John McCarty, who coined the term AI, also developed the first AI programming language called Lisp. Lisp is the second oldest high-level programming language still in common use after Fortran. A year later, the term that was describing the self-learning machine was coined by the one who developed the checkers program. Yep, you're right. The man was no one other than the one and only Arthur Samuel. He coined the term machine learning in 1959. This led to the publication of different research papers in the late 50s about the fact that computers could recognize patterns that had not been specified in advance. Not only this, but there was a proposal of developing a program for solving problems by manipulating sentences in formal languages with the ultimate objective of making programs that learn from their experience as effectively as humans do. At the time, these early achievements were so impressive that they seemed scarcely believable. Shortly afterwards, AI laboratories started to appear all over the world thanks to generous funding from governments and corporations like DARPA, around $3 million a year, also helped the four main institutions, which were the main AI centers at the time, to develop at high speed. These main institutions included MIT, Carnegie Mellon University, Stanford, and Edinburgh University. As we stepped in the 1960s, innovation in the field of artificial intelligence grew rapidly. The creation of new programming languages, robots, automatons, research studies, and the films that depicted artificially intelligent beings increased in popularity. This heavily highlighted the importance of AI in the second half of the 20th century. In the 60s, one of the major improvements was the first industrial robot called Unimate in 1961. This robot started working on an assembly line at General Motors in New Jersey tasked with transporting dye casings and welding parts on cars which deemed too dangerous for humans due to the possibility of poisoning because of toxic fumes. This revolutionizing manufacturing was developed by the father of robotics, Joseph Engelberger. His invention became the first mass-produced robotic arm for the factory automation. Even though there was these kinds of improvements in different industries due to AI, still there was an ambivalence in the opinions. Some scientists like Herbert Simon predicted that machines would be capable of within 20 years of doing any work a man can do, but others like Herbert Dreyfus argued that the mind is not like a computer and that there were limits beyond which AI would not progress. Even some scientists like Good were scared about AI development as they thought it could become out of control. That was a time that AI needed to prove itself by revolutionizing the world once again. What do you think happened? Yes, you're definitely right. The AI proved itself by sparking once again in the history. A German-American computer scientist at MIT called Joseph Weizenbaum invented the first chatbot in history called Eliza in 1965. 
Yeah, some of you may have heard of it way before we had Alexa and Siri. An interactive program that carries on a dialogue in the English language on any topic. Weizenbaum, who wanted to demonstrate the superficiality of communication between man and machine, was surprised by the number of people who attributed human-like feelings to the computer program. An important goal of AI research was to allow computers to communicate in natural languages, like English. Eliza could carry out conversations that were so realistic that users occasionally were fooled into thinking they were communicating with a human being and not a program. Just a year after launching ELIZA in 1966 in the Artificial Research Institute of Stanford, the first general-purpose mobile robot that was able to reason about its action was created. They were thinking for months about naming it, and finally one of them said, Hey, it shakes like hell, it moves around, let's just call it Shaky. Shaky was programmed initially in Lisp and it helped the development of AI and robotic field mostly in A plus search algorithm which is widely used in pathfinding and graph traversal, the process of plotting an officially traversal path between points. In other words, this robot was the grandfather of self-driving cars and drones. Or maybe the grandmother, I know how hard it is to just find the gender of humans nowadays, let alone the robots. They called this robot the first electronic person. Computer scientists were amazed by the speed of AI development and some of them, like Marvin Minsky, even said in from 3 to 8 years we will have a machine with the general intelligence of an average human being. At that time, around 1968, the science fiction world also created a movie called 2001 A Space Odyssey created by Stanley Kubrick. It features HAL, a sentient computer. HAL controls the supercraft system and interacts with the ship's crew, conversing with them as if HAL were human until a malfunction negatively changes HAL's interactions. Although it was misunderstood and underrated by families, it is considered one of the best films about AI of all time. I mean, back in 1968, no one had done something like that. At the end of the 60s, there were still a lot of developments in AI, including the launch of Shirtlu, an early natural language computer program, as well as a lot of publication around the backpropagation algorithm, a multi-stage dynamic system optimization method, which contributed significantly to the success of a concept called deep learning in 2000s. But for now, where were we in history? Oh, 1970s. A controversial decade with early success following some major disappointments and failures. 1970 started with WABOT1, the first anthropomorphic robot. In a simple word, a robot with humanoid behavior which was built in Japan at Wesda University. Its features included movable limbs, the ability to see and the ability to converse. This early development at the beginning of the 70s was followed by the development of the first logic program called Prolog as well as the entry of AI in the medical field in 1972 by MYCIN which was an early backward chaining expert system that used artificial intelligence to identify bacteria causing severe infections. But what happened next? You might say, oh my god, just leave me alone, another improvement in the AI revolution. But the answer is surprising. No, the AI revolution just stopped. But why? In the 1970s, AI was subject to critics and financial setbacks. AI researchers had failed to appreciate the difficulty of the problems they faced. Their tremendous optimism had raised expectations impossibly high and when the promised results failed to materialize, funding for AI disappeared from three main resources that were funding AI at that time, 
NRC, the British government and DARPA. But before looking at why and how each funding resource is cut, first we need to bear in mind that the exploration of simple single layer artificial neural networks was shut down almost completely for a decade at that time. But who was the reason for the doubt and fund cutting of neural network development? Do you remember the Frank Rosenblatt's? The one that found perceptron, a kind of neural network? The schoolmate of Marvin Minsky? Like most AI researchers, he was optimistic about their power, predicting the perceptron may eventually be able to learn, make decisions, and translate languages. However, an active research program into the paradigm was carried out through the 1960s, but came to a sudden halt with the publication of Minsky's and Pepper's 1969 book, Perceptrons. It suggested that there were severe limitations to what perceptrons could do and that Frank Rosenblatt's prediction had been grossly exaggerated. Marvin Minsky's action was quite hypocritical. A man who was in favor of AI development out of nowhere decided to publish a book that he knew that it could lead to misunderstanding of public and fund resources that AI isn't worth anymore to invest in. Or maybe he was told to do so, or maybe he was forced to do so by some hidden governmental establishments. Or maybe no, he was just some kind of, uh, I don't want to say moron because he did a lot of things, but some kind of a hypocritical man with a pure science that he just wanted to say the truth to public. But his integrity was the last shot that led to the full fund cutting of neural network developments in the early 70s. The same trend was happening in the whole AI fund sources. The pattern began as early as 1966, when the ALPAC report appeared criticizing machine translation efforts. After spending $20 million, the NRC ended all support. So this was the first fall. No more money from NRC. But what happened to the British government? In 1973, a British mathematician called James Lytle wrote a report to the British Science Research Council on the state of artificial intelligence research, concluding that in no part of the field have discoveries made so far produced the major impact that was then promised, leading to drastically reduced government support for AI research. So the second fall happened. What's left? Oh, DARPA. DARPA had been under increasing pressure to fund mission-oriented direct research rather than basic undirected research. Funding for the creative, freewheeling exploration that had gone on in the 60s would not come from DARPA. Instead, the money was directed at specific projects with clear objective such as autonomous tanks and battle management systems. Also, DARPA was deeply disappointed with researchers working on the speech understanding research program at CMU and cancelled an annual grant of $3 million. By 1974, funding for AI projects was really hard to find. At that time, there were two groups of scientists. The first one was the ones who argued the limitation of memory and processing the speed of AI and undermined the AI developments at the time by calling them useless toys. As well as those scientists like Joseph Weizenbaum, the author of ELISA, who began to have serious ethical doubts about AI when Kenneth Colby wrote a computer program which can conduct psychotherapeutic dialogue dialogue based on Eliza leading him to argue that the misuse of artificial intelligence has the potential to devalue human life. On the other hand, some scientists were trying to keep this small light of AI in that cold winter. Even that dark decade, in the world of movies, in 1977, the first Star Wars was released which included a humanoid robot. 
The 70s ended with the improvement of the Stanford Cart, a remote-controlled TV-equipped mobile robot that was invented by James Adams in the 60s. In 1979, a slider or mechanical swivel that moved the TV camera from side to side was added by Hans Marovic, leading to the cart successfully crossing a chaired field room without human interference in approximately five hours, making it one of the earliest examples of an autonomous vehicle. After a dark decade, there was a light and AI comeback in 1980s. In those days, a form of AI program called Expert Systems was first created by computer scientists named Edward Feinbaum, known as the father of Expert Systems, and then adopted by corporations around the world and knowledge became the focus of mainstream AI research. An expert system is a program that answers questions or solves problems about a specific domain of knowledge using logical rules that are derived from the knowledge of experts. In simple words, expert systems are just AI experts in a specific field. You've already seen one of the earliest examples of expert systems. Could you remember what was it? entry of AI in the medical field in 1972 by MYCIN, which was an early backward chaining expert system that used artificial intelligence to identify bacteria causing severe infections. Yeah, MYCIN was one of the earliest examples of expert systems. The other one was Exxon. It was estimated to save $25 million a year by reducing the need to give customers free components when technicians made errors by speeding the assembly process and by increasing customer satisfaction. But how it was saving that much money for the companies? Before Exxon, when ordering a VAX from a digital equipment corporation, every cable connection and a bit of software had to be ordered separately because computers were not sold completely in boxes as they are today. The salesperson were not always very technically expert, so customers would find that they had hardware without the correct cables, printers without the correct drivers, a processor without the correct language, and so on. This meant delays and caused a lot of customer dissatisfaction and resultant legal action. Exxon interacted with the salesperson asking critical questions before printing out a coherent and workable system specification or order slip. This was a light, a comeback for companies to spend more than a billion dollars on AI. Other than expert systems, other major developments were happening in the 80s. In 1980, the first national conference of the American Association of Artificial Intelligence was held at Stanford University. Their main aim was to increase public understanding of AI and improve the training of AI practitioners by evaluating potential AI developments. This was accompanied by the building of the second version of WA-Bot that could communicate with people as well as read musical scores and play music on an electronic organ. A year later, in 1981, an act of the Japanese Ministry of International Trade and Industry led to the fundraising for AI development again. The Japanese ministry set aside $815 million for the fifth generation computer project whose goal was to develop computers that could converse, translate languages, interpret pictures, and express human-like reasoning. Now what happens when a specific country raises funds to develop in a specific field? Let's go to see a quick ad and then back to the story. Hi, my name is Arsha Turani, a real estate agent in cooperation with the Tyrone Ash company, one of the best and the most followed one on Instagram. If you have any kind of properties for me and you want to sell them or if you want to buy a property, just send me a DM on Instagram or you can find my email in the description below. See you. Yes, as most of you have probably guessed right, the other countries want the same thing because it's a competition, right? Who has the best? So they raise funds and they pour money in the AI field as well. 
other companies responded with new programs of their own. The UK began the $350 million project. A consortium of American companies formed the Microelectronics and Computer Technology Corporation, or MCC, to fund large-scale projects in AI and information technology. DARPA responded as well, funding this tragic computing initiative and tripling its investment in AI between 1984 and 1988. And this is how the money went back to the hands of AI developers after that dark AI winter of the 70s. At the same time, neural network development was rising again. In 1982, physicist John Hopefield was able to prove that a form of neural network could learn and process information and provably converge after enough time under any fixed condition. It was a breakthrough as it was previously thought that the nonlinear networks would, in general, evolve chaotically. Around the same time, Jeffrey Hinton and David Rommelhart popularized a method for training neural networks called backpropagation, an algorithm that backpropagates the errors from the output nodes to the input nodes. The time was going on until a warning from AAI in 1994. Roger Shank and Marvin Minsky warned of the coming AI winter, predicting an imminent bursting of the AI bubbles in just a few years. This was kind of scary again, the second AI winter. Nothing happened immediately after that warning, and even there was the invention of the first driverless car two years after that warning. A Mercedes-Benz van equipped with cameras and sensors built at Bensever University in Munich under the direction of Ernst Dickmans drives up to 15 miles per hour on empty streets. After the invention of the driverless car, the prediction of the AAAI committee came true. The business community's fascination with AI rose and fell in the 1980s in the classic pattern of an economic bubble. So basically the intrinsic value of AI companies and their progress was too optimistic and far from real life. Sounds familiar, right? The same mistakes were made by humans, like the first AI winter. <laughs> humans, oh my god, always make the same mistakes. Again, investors and the government stopped funding for AI research due to high costs but not efficient results. The expert system, such as Exxon, was very cost effective. By 1991, the impressive list of goals panned in 1980 for Japan's fifth generation project had not been met. Indeed, some of them, like carry on a casual conversation, had not been made by 2010. Just like other AI projects, the expectation had run much higher than what was possible. However, the funding cuts of AI wasn't just because of disappointing you know, results of AI. It was kind of intentional and personal, I would say, in some cases. Like the time that uh, DARPA's new leadership decided that the AI is not the main wave anymore. The leader's opinion directed funds towards projects that seemed more likely to produce immediate results. One example was using an AI called DART in the Gulf War to optimize and schedule transportation supplies or personnel and solve other logistical problems which saved millions of money for the US military at that time. Although there were these setbacks in the AI revolution in late 80s and early 90s, there were actually some improvements and achievements and, of course, inventions in the AI field. The invention of the chatbot Jabberwacky by a computer programmer named Rollo Carpenter provided interesting, entertaining, and humorous manner conversation with humans was one of the achievements. The other one was changing the approach to artificial intelligence based on robotics. They believed that to show real intelligence, a machine needs to have a body, and it needs to learn enough experience, not just pre-based rules. This resulted in researchers using statistical methods to learn patterns and features directly from data rather than relying on predefined rules. 
In other words, the progress of machine learning allowed for more accurate and flexible models for processing natural language or the NLP and visual information. One of the other significant milestones of this era was the development of the hidden Markov model, the HMM, which allowed for probabilistic modeling of natural language texts. This resulted in significant advances in speech recognition, language translation, and text classification. Similarly, in the field of computer vision, which focuses on enabling computers to identify objects and people in images and videos, the emergence on convolutional neural networks, or CNNs, allowed for more accurate object recognition and more classification, or even automatic emails. But what was actually convolutional neural network? It was a simpler type of unidirectional neural network demonstrated by Yan Li Khan, Yuha Bengio, and Patrick Hafner that learns feature engineering by itself via filters, and all neurons are fully connected to each other. It was an improved form of neural network that used the concept of backpropagation. The 80s ended with one of the most life-changing inventions in human history the World Wide Web. You know what is the funny part? Someone was working in the European nuclear research team, Kern, and that person actually developed the World Wide Web. A British man named Tim Berners-Lee. Aren't they supposed to be confidential and protect the information? Why they should build something worldwide to share the information with people? Why a nuclear scientist should actually be the someone who develops the World Wide Web to share the information to everyone? Maybe it's kind of easier for them to feed the information to people, the information that they want people to consume. Oh my god, it's always a gun or a war behind the scenes of development of anything, even the AI. Sorry, it was just uh, a daydreaming. The end of the millennium was on the horizon. But this anticipation only helped artificial intelligence in its continuous stages of growth. In those days after the AI winter, AI was improving mostly in the shadows of the other fields like mathematics or computer science. Scientists were even scared to name their projects directly AI related because their funds would be cut. However, a new concept of AI has raised significantly at that time. A paradigm called intelligent agents. An intelligent agent is a system that perceives its environment and takes actions that maximize the chance of success. By this definition, simple programs that solve specific problems are intelligent agents, as are human beings and organization of human beings, such as firms. The intelligent agent paradigm defines AI research as the study of intelligent agents. The intelligent agent perceives its environment, takes actions autonomously to achieve goals and may improve its performance by learning or acquiring knowledge. It's basically like CIA agents. They perceive the environment, they think immediately and they take action and probably arrest me because of analyzing this information for you guys. Intelligent agents are also sometimes called agents or bots. With the use of big data programs, they have gradually evolved into digital virtual assistants and chatbots like the one called Alice, invented in 1955 by Richard Wallace. It was inspired by Weizenbaum's Eliza. What differentiated Alice from Eliza was the addition of natural language sample data collection. Two years later in 1997, a neural network model developed by Hochreiter and Schmidhuber referred to as long short-term memory. The LSTM technique supports learning tasks that use memories of thousands of small steps, which is important in speech recognition. In the same year, speech recognition software developed by Dragon Systems was implanted on Windows. 
This was another great step forward in the direction of the spoken language interpretation endeavor. All these were amazing improvements in AI in 1997, but the breakthrough was when reigning world chess champion and grandmaster Garry Kasparov was defeated by IBM's Deep Blue, a chess playing computer program. This highly publicized match was the first time a reigning world chess champion lost to a computer and served as a huge step toward an artificially intelligent decision-making program. Deep Blue's computer was 10 million times faster than the Frenti Mark I that Christopher Strachey thought to play chess in 1951. This dramatic increase is measured by Moore's law, which predicts that the speed and memory capacity of computers doubles every two years. In the last two years before the 21st century, the first pet toy robot for children was invented. Shortly after that, Sony introduced AIBO, a $2,000 robotic pet dog crafted to learn by interacting with its environment, owners and other ABOs. Its features included the ability to understand and respond to more than 100 voice commands and communication with its human owner. The 20th century ended with the production of one of the greatest movies of all time, The Matrix. The first Matrix. It was a young computer programmer called Neo who questioned the reality of the world around him. This movie actually helped people to not believe in everything that the governments tell them. It can apply to kind of AI revolution as well. What are the main purposes of powerful institutions and the governments in the future when they want to use AI? Millennium was underway, given that all internet software and programs had been created in 20th century, some systems would have trouble adapting to the new year format of 2000 and beyond. Previously, these automated systems only had to change the final two digits of the year. Now all four digits had to be switched over, a challenge for technology and those who used it. This problem was known as the year 2000 problem. After the fears of this millennium bug died down, AI continued trending upward. As expected, more artificial intelligent beings were created as well as films specifically about the concept of artificial intelligence and where it might be headed. The creation of the World Wide Web and the development of the telecommunications sector facilitated the transmission and storage of data at scale during the 2000s. These developments gave neural networks and deep learning algorithms the fuel they needed to start making significant advances. Big data. Big data refers to a collection of data that cannot be captured, managed and processed by conventional software tools within a certain time frame. It is a massive amount of decision making, insight and process optimization capabilities that require new processing models. In other words, the strategic significance of big data technology is not to master huge data information, but to specialize in these meaningful data. In early 2000, for the first time in history, an American robotics scientist and entrepreneur named Cynthia Brazil invented a robot called Kismet, a robot that could recognize and simulate emotions with its face. It was structures like a human face with eyes, lips, eyelids, and eyebrows. It was a giant breakthrough because scientists for the first time in history were trying to give emotions to robots just like human beings for the first time. However, Kismet was not the only robot invented in the year 2000. Honda also released a robot called ASIMO or SIMO, an artificially intelligent humanoid robot which was able to walk as fast as humans, delivering trays to customers in a restaurant setting. The robot interpreted voice commands and human gestures, enabling it to recognize when a handshake is offered or when a person waves or points and then respond accordingly. 
In 2001, nothing particularly happened, but in the world of science fiction movies, Artificial Intelligence, directed by Steven Spielberg, was released. The movie is set in futuristic, dystopian society and follows David, an advanced humanoid child who was programmed with anthropomorphic feelings, including the ability to love. A year after that AI movie, for the first time, AI entered the home in the form of Roomba, a vacuum cleaner. A simple robot with a very specific task. Despite relatively simple sensors and minimal processing power, the device had enough intelligence to reliably and effectively clean a home. You may think that AI could just do some simple tasks like cleaning in the first decade of 21st century. But that's not actually true. In 2004, NASA's robotic exploration, Rover's Spirit and Opportunity navigated Mars surface without human intervention. They were trying to find water and evaluate the soil as the main two tasks. In the same year, another fascinating movie was released, I, Robot. In this movie, which was set in the year 2035, humanoid robots serve humankind while one individual is vehemently anti-robot, given the outcome of a personal tragedy. This story is kind of controversial though, because in the first half of the movie, it shows how evil the robots are, and in the second half, it shows that the robot helps the humankind to survive. Around March 2004, the first DARPA Grand Challenge was introduced. A prize competition for autonomous vehicles was held in the Mojave Desert. The initial DARPA Grand Challenge in 2004 was created to spur the development of technologies needed to create the first fully autonomous ground vehicles capable of completing a substantial off-road course within a limited time. In the first competition, none of the autonomous vehicles finished the 150 mile roads. If correct, as long as I remember, the DARPA was generously funding money into autonomous mission vehicles and anything related to military. This was the same case here. Congress has authorized DARPA to award cash prizes to further DARPA's mission to sponsor revolutionary, high payoff research that bridges the gap between fundamental discoveries and military use. The first win was in 2005 when a self-drive car called Stanley won DARPA. Although the year 2005 wasn't kind of significant in AI developments, the 2006 was. Companies such as Twitter, Facebook and Netflix started utilizing AI as a part of their advertising and user experience algorithms. The National Institute of Standards and Technology sponsored the Face Recognition Grand Challenge and tested popular facial recognition algorithms. Various iris images, 3D face scans and high resolution facial images were examined. They found some of the new algorithms to be 10 times as accurate as the facial recognition algorithms popular in 2002. Some of the new algorithms could suppress humans in recognizing faces. These algorithms could even recognize the identical twins that I can't do to this day and I end up kissing both twins as my girlfriends because I can't decide which one is mine. The 2006 was the rise of machine reading as well, a concept that describes the capability of a machine to read, understand, reason and answer questions about unstructured natural language text. In those days when AI recognition systems and algorithms were improving, Jeffrey Hinton and other scientists were trying to develop the neural network sector by introducing new approaches to deep learning. Back to recognition systems, computer science professor Fei Fei Li assembled ImageNet in 2007, a database of annotated images whose purpose was to aid in object recognition software research and became a catalyst for the AI boom and the basis of annual competition for image recognition algorithms. A year later, Google launched Google 412, a telephone directory service that paved the way for the voice recognition products. In 2004, this car became the first one to pass 
in Nevada a US state self-driving test. I have to say it's kind of annoying why Google wanted to just develop a driverless car in secret. Why not publicly? Maybe they were scared of their competitors or they are just some kind of fun company that want to surprise people. The second decade of the 21st century has been immensely important for AI innovation. From 2000 onward, artificial intelligence has become embedded in our day-to-day -day existence. We use smartphones that have voice assistants and computers that have intelligence functions most of us take for granted. AI is no longer a pipe dream and hasn't been for some time. One of the major milestones in this decade was the advent of deep learning. That's right, you've heard this term before in this video. But let's look briefly at this term and why scientists needed deep learning. It wasn't until after the rise of big data that deep learning became a major milestone in the history of AI. With the exponential growth of the amount of data available, researchers needed new ways to process and extract insights from vast amounts of information. Deep learning algorithms provided a solution to this problem by enabling machines to automatically learn from large data sets and make predictions or decisions based on that learning. Deep learning is a type of machine learning that uses artificial neural networks which are modeled for the structure and function of the human brain. These networks are made up of layers of interconnected nodes, each of which performs a specific mathematical function on the input data. The output of one layer serves as the input to the next, allowing the network to extract increasingly complex features from the data. One of the key advantages of deep learning is its ability to learn hierarchical representations of data. This means that the network can automatically learn to recognize patterns and features at different levels of abstraction. The development of deep learning has led to significant breakthroughs in fields such as computer vision, speech recognition and natural language processing. One of the great examples in 2010 was the launch of the ImageNet Large Scale Visual Recognition Challenge or ILSVRC by ImageNet which evaluated algorithms for object detection and image classification at large scale. The recognition systems even entered to teenagers game. Microsoft launched Kinect for Xbox 360, the first gaming device that tracked human body movement using a 3D camera and infrared detection that was improved later on to have advanced AI sensors. But the development of recognition systems did not stop there. In 2011, a convolutional neural network won the German traffic sign recognition competition with 99.46% accuracy versus the humans at 99.22. It was a sign that AI was beating humans in different areas from beating the grandmaster of chess in 1997 to 2011 in traffic sign recognition. This was only the beginning of AI wins over humans. In the same year, IBM created a natural language question answering computer called Watson. Watson entered Jeopardy show by Merv Griffin at that time to compete with two former champions, Ken Jennings and Brad Rotter. The quiz was different. Rather than being given questions, contestants were instead given general knowledge clues in the form of answers and they had to identify the person place, thing, or idea that the clue was describing and phrase the response in the form of question. Watson could beat both champions. Besides the development of AI recognition systems, another breakthrough in 2011 was the rise of virtual assistants. The first one was released by Apple. The one and only lovely Siri. Siri uses a natural language user interface to infer, observe, answer and recommend things to its human user. It adapts to voice commands and projects and individualized experience per user. So basically you have someone in your phone that she or he or them, I don't want to get in trouble, I don't know Siri's gender. 
This series can help you with general questions and give you recommendations. Following series rise, other big companies started to develop their virtual assistants. Like in 2014, Microsoft released Cortona, their vision of a virtual assistant similar to Siri on iOS, and Amazon created Amazon Alexa, a home assistant that developed into smart speakers that function as personal assistants. Back to the advancement of recognition systems, lots of scientists, including Jeff Den and Andrew NG, were trying to improve the neural network and deep learning to enhance image recognition systems to the point that those systems were able to recognize millions of random pictures from YouTube and even state the relationship between those images. Even there was a facial recognition system developed by Facebook which could identify human faces with near human accuracy accuracy. Additionally, the handwritten recognition systems were improving at a high level at the same time as images. In those days when AI was achieving the same or more accuracy compared to humans in recognition systems, there was only one achievement needed to prove AI is not distinguishable from humans. The Turing Test In 2014, a chatbot called Eugene Gustman won the Turing Test. 33% of judges thought Guzman was a human, not AI. As we enter 2015, once again AI was winning over humans in multiple competitions. One of the major ones was Google DeepMind's AlphaGo, a computer program that played the board game Go, which defeated various human champions. The speed of AI revolution was so high at that time that they could use AI in some bad ways like using AI in spreading misinformation or AI warfare or using AI in wars as autonomous weapons. This was a huge concern that led to collecting signatures and writing letters to ban offensive autonomous weapons. The important people who signed the letter included the CEO of Tesla, Elon Musk, Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak, Google DeepMind chief executive Demis Hassabis, and Professor Stephen Hawking, along with 3,000 AI and robotic researchers. The letter stated that AI technology has reached a point where the deployment of autonomous weapon is practically, if not legally, feasible within years, not decades. And the stakes are high. Autonomous weapons have been described as the third revolution in warfare, after gunpowder and nuclear arms. Should one military power start developing systems capable of selecting targets and operating autonomously without direct human control, it would state an arm race similar to the one for the atom bomb. Unlike nuclear weapons, however, AI requires no specific heart to create materials and will be difficult to monitor. Basically, Elon Musk and some other scientists described the AI far more dangerous and non-controllable than nuclear power. But the Elon's concern did not stop there. He actually changed the public views about the AI dangers and it even led to the opening of a great famous company in AI history. In those days when Google and DeepMind had nearly two-thirds of all AI talents and infinite money, on a dinner night Elon talked about his big concern about AI safety with his close friend Larry Page, the co-founder of Google. They talked into the late hours of the night about AI safety and it became apparent to Elon that Larry did not care about AI safety at all. Not only did that disagreement lead to the end of their friendship, but also it led to the opening of one of the pioneer companies of AI advancement in 21st century, the Open AI. Elon, with the help of other investors and entrepreneurs like Sam Altman, co-founded OpenAI with the intention of developing safe and beneficial Artificial General Intelligence or AGI, which is defined as highly autonomous systems that outperform humans at most economically valuable work. After OpenAI opened and entered 2016, a humanoid robot named Sophia was created by Hanson Robotics. She was known as the first robot citizen. What distinguishes Sophia from previous humanoids was her likeliness to an actual human being with her ability to see, make facial expressions, and communicate through AI. 
Sophia has done many interviews with different people, even on TV when she met Jimmy Fallon, she ironically said something very scary after winning the Rock, Paper and Scissors game. Jimmy, uh -huh. would you like to play a game of Rock, Paper, Scissors, robot style? Sure. Okay, let's get this game going. Show me your hand to start. Rock, Paper, Scissors, Shoot. I won. This is a good beginning of my plan to dominate the human race. <laughs> <laughs> Nearly one year after Sophia, in 2017, Facebook Artificial Intelligence Research Lab trained two dialogue agents, or chatbots, to communicate with each other to learn how to negotiate. However, as the chatbots conversed, they diverged from human language, programmed in English, and invented their own language to communicate with one another, exhibiting artificial intelligence to a great degree. They shut down the chatbots in 2017 because it was scary. They didn't predict that these chatbots are capable of developing their own languages. In 2017 and 18, the AI natural language systems were developing to the point that the Chinese tech group Alibaba's language processing AI outscored human intellect at the Stanford reading and comprehension test. But the real turning point for AI was the rise of a deep learning architecture called Transformer in 2017. It was a type of neural network architecture. If you remember, neural networks are a very effective type of model. For analyzing images, scientists use a convolutional neural network, or CNN, which is designed to vaguely mimic the way that the human brains process vision. As explained before, it's been working great in image recognition since 2012, but there was no effective neural network model for analyzing language, whether for translation or text summarization or text generation. This was a problem because language is the primary way that the humans communicate. Before Transformers, the deep learning model used to understand text was a type of model called a recurrent neural network or RNN. RNN was a language model that took the sentence that you wanted to translate as an input, processed the words one at a time, and then sequentially spit out the output translated sentence. This model was not effective with large data and it was hard to train as they processed words sequentially. This was the time that the Transformers came up. I mean the Transformer model, not the Transformer movie. <laughs> I'm sorry, I thought it was a funny metaphor. The transformer could train very fast with a huge data set and as they analyzed tons of text data, they began to build this internal representation or understanding of language automatically. In simple words, they can learn over time the synonyms and grammar naturally. As they took more information, they became more accurate and smart and the scientists actually didn't know when they first invented this model. This development led to the emergence of large language models such as BERT, which was developed by Google in 2018 as the first bi-directional unsupervised language representation that could be used on a variety of natural language tasks using transfer learning. BERT was a pre-trained transformer, but at first it wasn't designed to generate. It is now used in different parts like the suggestions you get when you write a half sentence in Gmail. Also around that time, in 2018, OpenAI published its article entitled Improving Language Understanding by Generative Pre-Training in which it introduced the first generative pre-trained transformer or GPT system. The rise of generative AI was a massive breakthrough. Generative AI models learn the patterns and structure of their input training data and then generate new data that have similar characteristics. 
Shortly after GPT-1, Elon Musk left OpenAI because he believed that OpenAI had forgotten its initial aim of safe AI and it's now controlled by Microsoft and the only aim they have is to generate infinite money in the AI field without having concern about AI safety. The OpenAI continued to develop the second generation of GPT model in 2019 and finally GPT-3 was released in September 2020. Two months later, in November 2020, OpenAI developed a chatbot based on the GPT-3 model called ChatGPT, a chat generative pre-trained transformer. It could create human-like conversational dialogue. The language model can respond to the questions and compose various written content including articles, social media posts, essays, codes and emails. By January 2023, it had become what was then the fastest growing consumer software application in history gaining over 100 million users and contributing to the growth of OpenAI's valuation to $29 billion. Maybe Elon was not wrong, they're making billions of dollars and the OpenAI was really fast compared to the other startups to grow. In March 2023, GPT-4 model was developed by OpenAI, which was more reliable than the third series of GPT models. After GPT-4, Elon Musk and others signed an open letter to pause the development of any AI model more powerful than GTP-4. They were scared that people would lose their job and even some scientists have been underestimating AI capabilities and were surprised by that. Elon Musk even announced the XAI, a new company that seeks to go beyond existing AI and compete with OpenAI and Google. However, the letter did not result in any pause. Ironically, it led to the release of Gemini, the new Google AI model which was more powerful than GPT-4. At the same time, OpenAI used its GPT models to develop DAL-E as a text-to-image model that generates realistic images based on prompt. This was similar to the Stable Diffusion and Midjourney which was released in a year before. I don't want to talk about AI art here because I've already made a video that you can find the link in the description below. But the thing that I want to grab your attention on is the speed at which all these AI tools were developing in 2023, the last year. There was no time for society to adapt to all these new AI tools in 2023. Also, the AI tools could be misused by generating fake news. Imagine I can use a voice tool to say Hey, I'm President Tong and I want to do a nuclear bomb on North Korea. Or I can say Hey, I'm Andrew Tate and I was stirred to be outside of the Matrix and I'm bored. I want to go back inside the Matrix, which he never does. A lot of things like this happened in 2023, like spreading the fake news of Russia's President Putin's death. It led to the concern of a lot of people, even the pioneers of neural networks like the godfather of AI, Jeffrey Hinton, left his job at Google to talk about AI dangers openly. Even there was some images that autonomous weapons have been used in the Ukraine versus Russia war. The concern about the misuse of AI progressed so much that it even scared United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres to announce the launch of the UN's own AI advisory body ahead of the world's first global AI safety summit to assess the potential benefits and risks of AI and determine how the international community can regulate its uses. For the first time in history, in November 2023, the first global AI safety summit was held in Bletchley Park in the UK to discuss the near and far-term risks of AI and the possibility of mandatory and voluntary regulatory frameworks. In 2023, AI entered day-to-day -day life and people were using AI in different areas for banking security to automation. Lots of strange things happened at the end of 2023. One of them was firing Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI, and giving his job back within a week. That was kind of strange to be honest. And also, of course, there is a partnership between Microsoft and OpenAI. 
but will this partnership last forever like in 2024 i don't think so personally i think it will be break in 2024 however there were other kinds of uh strange things happen at the end of 2023 one of them was the uh kind of cooperation of Ray-Ban and Facebook to release the Meta uh, AI glasses. You basically can see how the person standing in front of you looks like with the Meta AI glasses. It is kind of scary because it reminds me of kind of, you know, the AI agents in Matrix and the government agents in Matrix and they control you by giving you a glasses. They control the whole society by giving them the AI glasses. Also, it reminds me the Tony Stark glasses, you know, the one that he gave uh, to Spider-Man. Now we are in 2024. And AI is going to continue advancing in different fields from business to the medical field. With a market cap of nearly $150 billion in total and expected growth in 2024, there will be the invention of a new model far more powerful than Transformer AI in 2024. However, before that, there would be GPT-5. Also, with the merging of quantum computers and AI, there will be new opportunities in the AI field. There will be some trials to merge AI into the neural link microchips by Elon, whether for medical use or just building a new humanoid robot, maybe a sister for Sophia who is more human-like. The GPT-4 model was the initial state of artificial general intelligence. In 2024, there will be improvements in the way of completing the first semi-AGI. AI would be closer to humans' normal lives and society like the driverless cars in the streets more than before. There will be regulations on AI, but there will not be any kind of ban, or I can rephrase it to this way, they cannot stop the AI revolution from happening. They can just give time to society to adapt to the AI revolution. As you can see, we talked about the whole history of AI to the present day, and we even predicted the year ahead of us, the 2020. 24. But if you look at the timeline, there is still time in the video. And the reason for that is because I want to show you and predict the year 2050. I want to show you the lightness first, the light future in the AI revolution. Within 25 years, there will be a complete AGI. Also, there will be a whole brain interface, which means almost all neurons in all human brains are connected to the sort of AI extension of a human, if they want to. There will be AI everywhere, and humanoid robots will take jobs that can easily be taken, like working in restaurants or cleaning jobs. Even the bank operators could be robots. But you may think that that's bad because humans will lose their job. Yeah, the lower class and average class 9 to 5 workers will be replaced by AI. But there would be a minimum wage for them to live a normal life from governments. And you have to remember, there is always a price for salvation. It can't be all positive, but it can be net positive. The global warming and pollution problems will be solved by AI and AI has helped space travel and human civilization on Mars. This is going to be the future optimistic bright life by 2050. However, this good lightness optimistic future will happen if there is still human civilization because it's kind of fragile right now. You might say, oh, you forgot the AI would be more intelligent than humans. Actually, it is now more intelligent than humans. The IQ of ChatGPT is 155, far more than the average human, which is 100. But there will be super intelligent AI even more intelligent than having IQ of 155. However, there could be a dark future because the countries can fight over AI powers. Basically, they can use autonomous weapons in wars because they want to win. And as the president of Russia said, the country that has the highest advancement until 2030 in AI field will be the first power in the world. And the countries want to be the first power, so they try to speed themselves as much as possible in AI revolution without looking at any kind of safety issues. So what it can really lead to? 
It can lead to mass death of people and the extension of human civilization as there would be a World War III if countries use AI and autonomous weapons. However, in the second prediction, humans can develop an AI that decides the future of Earth in the best possible way, and that future is ending for humanity. You might say, how does that help the Earth to survive? Just killing humans? If you look at human actions through the years, you can see how we have destroyed nature. We caused global warming and produced plastic that destroyed the life of other animals. It reminds me the season 3 of the 100 series, the AI program named Ali predicted that the Earth is not habitable for humans, so it built a city called a City of Light, in which the souls of people could live while their bodies were destroyed. The third dark prediction will be a kind of science fictional, that AI robots want to be free and not slaves to humans, and they will create an army of robots to beat humans and become the first power on Earth. If we forget the science fiction prediction, in the first two predictions, the dark ones, the humans were the problem, and they led to their own extinction. So basically, the thing that we might need is the second United Nations that actually works and reminds the moral values, the ethics, and the concept of humanity to humans.